the greatest unsung hero of all time, featuring Tommy Prince. Hi, my name is Thomas George Prince, and this is my Draw My Life. My story starts when I was born in Petersfield, Manitoba, on the 15th of October, 1915. My family consisted of 13 members, me, my mom Elizabeth, my dad Harry, and my 10 siblings. When I was five, my family moved to the Broken Head Reserve just outside of Scanterbury, about 80 kilometers north of Winnipeg. Growing up, I never attended school, so I missed out on that experience. However, my dad taught me the essential skills like how to hunt and how to set traps. Little did I know that those days I spent with my dad would come in handy, but I'll explain that later. When I grew into my teenage years, I also joined the Army Cadets. That was where I perfected my skill with the rifle, until I was able to put five bullets through a target the size of a playing card at 100 meters. This was also when I realized that I loved the feeling of putting on a uniform. It was as if the uniform itself gave me the strength and courage that pushed me to take on the world. This feeling eventually got me to try and join the army at the age of 18. But little did I know that even with multiple tries, I would be rejected due to my aboriginal background. Of course, you wouldn't know that, since I haven't told you yet. So yeah, I'm an aboriginal. My great-great-grandfather was the famous Chief Pegwi, the Suto chief that led our people to the southwestern shore of Lake Winnipeg in the late 1700s from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. I never thought that would be something that would stop me from anything, but in the 1900s, it was a different time. Back then, anyone else who was not of English background was denied the ability to take part in the war. I wish I'd known that sooner. Maybe I would have been more prepared for what I had to face. But finally, on one faithful day, when war broke out in Europe, I was accepted and started off as a field engineer with the Royal Canadian Engineers. My role was to assist in the design and process of defensive works, communicative lines, and bridges. It was also common for us engineers to provide water, power, and other utilities for the camps. I stayed as an engineer for around two years until I volunteered to be a paratrooper with a Canadian Parachute Battalion in June 1940. The training was exhausting and not many were successful in completing it. Originally, there were a hundred paratroopers in training and I was one of the nine who finished it, earning my wings from parachute school in the little area of Ringway near Manchester, England. I wasn't a good paratrooper because I excelled in jumping out of planes, but from my natural instinct to ground, I would land and creep forward on my stomach. As a result from my impressive skills, I was promoted to Lance Corporal. Around September of 1942, I flew back to Canada to train with the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, where I was soon promoted again to sergeant. My position let me work with the United States Special Force known as the Green Barrettes. This special force was an experiment to bring the U.S. and Canada together using 1,600 of the toughest men to be found in Canada and the United States, or so they say. We were all qualified paratroopers and were skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, mountain climbing, and fighting as ski troops. Our elite force was called into action in January 1943 when the Japanese occupied Kiska, an island near Alaska, but the Japanese withdrew and our services were dismissed. Later in February of 1944, the Special Service Force made a daring deed on the Azio beachhead in Italy when we fought on the front lines for 90 days without relief. This was the very place where our force earned the name Devil's Brigade. It was said that in the diary of a dead German soldier, it read, The black devils are all around us every time we come into the line. I guess that diary was referring to when we smeared our faces with black dye and sneak packed the Axis lines in the night to cut their throats. One of my most recognized feats was on February 8, 1944. In Italy, I was assigned to spy on the Germans from a nearby farmhouse where I could report on their camp activity. That was until enemy shell fire cut off the communication wire. But that wouldn't stop me, and I decided to um, borrow some farm clothes and act as a farmer tending my crops. It was now or never. And no, I wasn't shot as I walked out of the farmhouse. At that time, many Italian farmers remained on their farms even when war raged all around them. So being the angry farmer that I was, I went out and shook my fist at both the German-Italian line and then the Allied line. I then proceeded to pretend to work while I followed the radio line to find where the break happened. When I found it, I dropped to tie my shoe and repair the lines before I went back into the farmhouse. 
and I did this while in full view of the German soldiers. It was exhilarating and scary being so close to the enemy, but I guess that means I have really good acting skills, right? After that, I continued to relay enemy positions, and this resulted in the destruction of four enemy tanks that had been firing at the Allies. What a day. Months later, on September 1st, 1944, a private and I took a long endeavor to get to enemy-held territory. It took miles of walking and days on days of no food or water to locate the camp. I don't remember how long it took, but I do remember coming across a battle between some Germans and French Partisans. Sneaking from behind the Germans, the private and I killed them off until the field was clear and we were able to talk to the French leader. He looked at me and asked, Where is the rest of your company? To which I responded by pointing at the private and saying, Here. Man, you should have seen his face. He was so surprised. He said, Mon Dieu, which means, My God, for you non-French speakers out there. I thought there were at least 50 of you. Apparently, I was rec recommended for the Croix de Guerre, aka the Cross of War, but something happened in between, so the message never got to the French commander-in-chief, Charles de Gaulle. Anyway, the private and I eventually gained and mapped out valuable information on the enemy positions, gun locations, and camps. And when I went back, the units set out and captured more than 1,000 German soldiers. But the fight still wasn't over. I had to return to help out with the front line where we breached the enemies and launched an attack on their camp using my information. I had been so accurate with the mapping that we were able to wipe out that whole camp. It was a relief when everything was over, September 5th, and I could eat and sleep after being unable to for 72 hours, fighting two battles and covering 70 kilometers by foot. From these two accomplishments, I received the military medal from King George VI, which I got from being recommended by my CO, Lieutenant Colonel Gilday, for exceptional bravery in the field. It was one of my proudest and cherished moments along with when I received the Silver Star on that same day on behalf of the American President Roosevelt. I was one of the 59 Canadians awarded with the U.S. Silver Star and one of the three that got the military medal. But that's not all I got. I was also rewarded the 1939 to 1945 star, the Italy star, the France and Germany star, the Defense Medal, the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal with CLASP, and the War Medal. That's nine whole medals, in case you haven't been counting. After all these awards, on December 1944, the Devil's Brigade was disbanded and the war in Europe ended. I was discharged, honorably, may I say, from the military on June 15, 1945. It was time to go home. However, in Canada, I was not given the same treatment as I received out on the battlefield. Shocking. I know. I mean, I won nine medals. Okay, I'll, I'll stop bragging about it. But it wasn't fair. In Canada, Aboriginal people were still not allowed to vote in federal elections. Plus, I was refused the same benefits as other Canadian veterans. So that's when I decided to open my own cleaning business with a bit of help from the Department of Veteran Affairs. And for some time, it prospered. Seeing that it was well off, I decided to leave it into the care of my friends so that I could be a spokesperson for the Manitoba Indian Association. I would become an Aboriginal activist to lobby for the change of the Indian Act, which was still a thing then. However, after campaigning, I went home and realized my business had bailed in without me. Some friends I have, right? But I couldn't blame them. Not really. And now that I was both discriminated against and unemployed, I returned to the military. This time serving with the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, PPCLI. I resumed my rank as sergeant. I helped train new recruits for the Korean War and served with the PPCLI Rifle Platoon and the first Canadian unit to land in Korea. Far away in Korea, I led many snatch patrols, which were basically small groups of soldiers who would travel into enemy territory and launch sneak attacks before retreating. One overnight raid gave us at least two enemy machine guns. Imagine just how many we got. But I wasn't invincible. Despite not being killed after all this time, I had bad knees. I went back in Canada for treatment in 1951, but I just couldn't stay while a war was happening out there. And so, I went back to Korea for a second tour in the next year. That was a bad decision. 
I got injured again and spent weeks in the hospital where I was still recovering. During my hospital stay, the Korean Armistice Agreement was signed in 1953, ending the fighting. It ended that war, but not my pain. I continued to have painful swelling in my knees from the constant climbing of the steep Korean countryside. On the bright side, due to my amazing performance, I won both the Canadian and the Korean Volunteer Service Medal and the United Nations Service Medal. I stayed in the Army until September 1954 when I was discharged with a small pension because of my terrible knees and left to Canada. Since I couldn't fit back into the post-war boom, I had to try to find regular low-status jobs. My skills as a prized soldier in the war was disregarded completely, leaving only scorn from the white workers. Back at Canada, I got married to Verna St. Clair. We had five children, three boys and two girls. And I still faced discrimination at all my jobs, so I kind of just quit. I was getting sick of all this racism, so I drank and I drank. And my arthritic knees got worse, and money went down the drain, and Verna and I got divorced in 1964. My children were placed in a foster home by the Children's Aid Society. That must have been the worst years of my life. I deeply regret what I did, and I tried to keep in touch with my children, but they moved from foster home to foster home. Only one of my daughters, Beryl, stayed in one foster home for seven years, so I visited her monthly. I never stopped trying to find my other children but my searches were fruitless. In the years before my death, I was a truly forgotten man, and I decided to pawn my medals for some money to get by in life. On November 1977, at the age of 62, I died at Winnipeg's Deer Hospital. At my funeral, a delegation of Princess Patricias served as pallbearers, and a Canadian flag was draped over my coffin for the memorial service. It was attended by active soldiers, veterans and representatives from France, Italy, and United States, friends and family, plus my two daughters, Beryl and Beverly. Where were my sons? Good question. I don't know. Other than that, I didn't know anyone there. Who were the rest of these people? Why were they here now when I had struggled so much the years before? Did they really care or was it all a show? Either way, that's my story. Me, Thomas George Prince, the greatest unsung Canadian hero of all time. I prove that anyone can do anything, regardless of their background. I divide the racial stereotypes that were thrust on me and pave the ways for others to learn how to stand up for themselves. And of course, I got medals. If you want to see them, 10 have been verified as the originals by the War Museum in Ottawa and will be held in trust for the Prince family at the Museum of Man and Nature in Winnipeg. Despite what happened to me, my life was not wasted. I only had one goal in mind this whole time. All my life, I had wanted to do something to help my people recover their good name.